Welcome back. I am here with a very special guest, Stefan Schwartz. Stefan, welcome. Thank you, Sean. So today we're going to discuss a relatively popular topic. And by popular, I don't mean happy, but it might be happy. There might be some good implications. But we're going to talk about remote viewing of 2050 that Stefan Schwartz has done in the past and what we can expect. Now, I will juxtapose some of the questions that I have against the remote viewing that Lynn Buchanan did back at the turn of the century. He did it about 10 years earlier, so the period 2020 to 2040. But some of the trends, based on what I've observed from prior interviews that Stefan has done, are similar, and then there are some differences. So with that, Stefan, can you level set the audience about exactly what this pro- program was like how you, what, what the methodology of the study was how many remote viewers it, the kind of just generalized questions that you've asked in the 2050 study well you, you have to really see this sean rather differently than you're describing it let me get to its beginnings uh, i was in government and i was special assistant to the chief of naval operations And I did some work with the National Security Council, and I was part of the MIT Secretary of Defense discussion group on innovation technology in the future. And so I left government in 76, and I had a little girl, a daughter, and I got worried because having been part of the geopolitical community, When I left government, I was convinced we were going to have a nuclear war because either by accident or intent, and in fact, almost by accident, we almost did have a a nuclear war. Mm -hmm. It all got down to one Soviet colonel who wouldn't push the button for the rockets. But in any case, so I thought, well, we're going to have a nuclear war, and I got this little girl and my daughter, and what kind of world is she going to live in? And so in 1978, I decided that I would do this remote viewing project, which has now been going on for whatever it is, 45 years. And I had recently discovered something about Jules Verne in a book he had written about the future that people found so bizarre, although it turned out to be highly accurate, that I realized if you go too far into the future, you don't don't understand what people are talking about. In 1920, if you had done a remote viewing and somebody said, well, they've got something that's smaller than your shoe print, that'll allow you to talk to anybody in the world, what would you have made of that? Right. So I didn't want to get too far out because I knew I wouldn't understand what they were talking about. And I thought, well, I'll go 2050 because in 1978, I thought, well, I'll be able to understand whatever people talk about. It'll all sound reasonable. and I mean, And also... I can begin to analyze from non-locally sourced information. I'll be able to see whether these things that they're describing are correct. So I started interviewing people in 1978. I eventually interviewed about 4,000 people. Mm -hmm. And I asked them to describe the same day and month that we did the interview in the year 2050. So if you and I were doing this, I would say, Sean, I want you to go forward in time to January 31st, and I want you to, in 2050, and describe for me what you see. So I did that, and it's now been long enough that we can assess quite accurately how correct these remote viewing descriptions were. Now, who were these 4,000 people? Were they Oh, they were all kinds of people. I did it all over the world. I I did it in Japan, uh, Germany, the United States, Canada, Jamaica, England, Italy, France, Taiwan. I mean, all over the place. And they were all kinds of people. They were 
scientists, they were housewives, they were just a general audience. And how did they learn how to remote view? Did they have any inclination? No. no. I included people who were familiar with remote viewing. But most of these people, no, they were not remote viewers in the sense of they did this on a regular basis. I taught them how to do it. And then I asked them to do it. And a methodology that I use, the Mobius methodology, which I developed, I started doing this kind of research in 1968. Mm -hmm. I originally called it distant viewing. Ingo Swan is the one who invented the term remote viewing. And they're both terrible terms, by the way, because it has nothing to do with distance or remoteness, and it has nothing mm -hmm. to do with viewing. But that's where we understood things at that time. Anyway, I would call it non-local perception today. Mm -hmm. But in any case, I look for where there is consensus. It's exactly the same technique that you do in intelligence service or that investigative reporters use. And I had been an investigative reporter, so I was very familiar with this. You know, if, if you suddenly heard an, an explosion outside of wherever it is you are, and you went out and you saw a group of people, what would you do? Well, you'd take them aside one by one and say, well, what did you see? And they wouldn't all see the same thing. They'd be at different angles. Men and women focus on different things. Research shows that, for instance, if a car was involved, men would be more likely to be able to give you the brand of the car. Women would be more likely to give you the color of the car correctly. It's mosaic so theory, I, essentially, which what investors do. Very similar. Yeah, it's, exactly. It's the same yeah. technique that they, they use in the intelligence community or that they use in the investigative journalism community. So I ask numbers of people the same questions, and what I'm looking for is consensus and also low a priori observations. Mm -hmm. If I ask you to describe a ship and you talk about an anchor, well, ships have anchors, so that could be correct, but it's also typical. But if you, in describing a shipwreck, said to me, you're going to find a big wooden box, and it's filled with these little two-inch long glass vials that have colored powders in them. I don't expect to hear that. But in fact, this is an actual situation. When we did find the ship where they located it, we did find a wooden box filled with these little glass vials, about two inches, that were filled with colored powders. It turned out to be 18th century medicines. But in any case, I'm looking for low a priori, and I'm looking for consensus. And so I started in 78, and as I said, I was principally concerned about nuclear war because I had this child, and I wanted to know what her world was going to be like. That's what was driving this. And because of my participation in the geopolitical world and everything I had learned there, I thought we were going to have a nuclear war, either by accident or intent. And so when I asked people, talk to me about 2050, have we had a nuclear war? They said no. And I thought that was great. And I said, well, then is the world safer? And they said, oh, no, the world is much more dangerous. Really? Why? And they said, because of terrorism. Now, in 1978-79, if you were talking about terrorism, what you were talking about is the struggle between the Roman Catholic and Protestant people in Northern Ireland. The idea that terrorism as a proposition would become a world issue that made the world unsafe in many ways, just nobody thought about that. And when I talked to people who said, you see terrorism becoming a huge problem, they all said, no, you know, there's this stuff in Ireland, but, and yet that turns out to be exactly correct. Yeah, 1979 and I was talked to them about, yeah. yeah, and I said, well, what is healthcare like? Mm 
and they said to me that healthcare would be very different. Then they described what today we would call CRISPR technology, which at the time no didn't exist, so nobody knew about it. But it turns out to be correct. And also, I said, "Well, are people generally healthier?" And they said, "Well, yes and no. There's going to be a series of pandemics." And I thought, you know, like the Spanish flu of 1918. I thought pandemics, really? What? And they said, "Well, the first one will be a blood disease which crosses over from primates to humans in Africa, and it's going to kill millions of people." And I went around to a friend of mine who was the deputy director of National Institutes of Health, and I said to him, "Do you know anything about a blood disease that's going to cross over from primates to humans, and that could kill millions of people?" And he said, "No, that's just nonsense. I don't know anything about that." And then, of course, that was 78, 79, 80, 81. The first cases of HIV, AIDS came out, and it eventually killed 35 million people. And they said there would be several of these. And then, of course, AIDS. Then came、uh, SARS, H1N5, and now we have COVID. In talking to them about the future and safety, I said, "Well, you know, if we don't have a nuclear war, what happens with the Soviet Union?" <laughs> and they said, "Well, it doesn't exist." And I went around and talked to all my friends in the intelligence world and all that, and said, "Can you think of any reason the Soviet Union would not exist, would cease to exist?" And they all, you know, said to me, "No, that's crazy." At that time, we were in a bipolar world, two superpowers: Soviet Union, United States. And yet, in 1991, on Christmas Day, the Soviet Union ceased to exist. In my archaeological remote viewing research and other things, criminological work, I expect to see that about 35 to 40 percent of the material you can't evaluate.、Mm -hmm. Not that it's wrong, but that if you say the pilot who was flying his plane as his plane crashed was thinking of his wife and children, well, that may be true, but there's no way to evaluate it. Right. So about 35 to 40 percent of this material, you just can't evaluate. Sometimes less, sometimes more. But of the rest, you expect to see about 85 percent to be correct or partially correct. That means. If I said the man interviewing me had a dark gray shirt, and you actually have a black shirt, I consider partially correct. That is, they're describing your shirt. If they said it's a T-shirt, but they were wrong about the color, it was darker. We call that partially correct, but operational.、Mm -hmm. And so we expect to see about 85 to 90 percent of the material be either correct or partially correct, but operational. And so I knew that from archaeological work that I had done, and I saw pretty much the same thing when I was doing the 2050 work, and it was also the same thing that the Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research Group was looking at, what they were seeing, what the SRI group was seeing.、Mm -hmm. So we expect to see, as I say. Uh, a percentage can't be evaluated, but that this material is highly accurate. And over time, from '78 to today, the predictions that we got in the 2050 experiment turn out to be highly accurate. I mean, for instance, but I would ask people, "What's it like where you are?" And when I interviewed people, for instance, in Los Angeles, I said, "What's Los Angeles like?" And they said, "Well, of course, a large part of it's underwater." And I said, "Underwater? Why would it be underwater?" And they said, "Well, the sea is higher." And、I、didn't have any idea how that could possibly be. I、mm -hmm. went to a friend who was one of the leading climatologists in the United States, and I said to him. Do you know anything about why specifically 
Santa Monica, Manhattan Beach, Hermosa Beach, why parts of those would be underwater? And he said, well, no, because the sea would have to rise quite a bit in order for that to be true. And no, I don't know anything about that. But of course, in 1991, I got introduced to climate change. And now that is exactly what they're predicting. What did you see in regions like San Francisco? Same thing or different? Oh, same thing. Norfolk, Virginia Beach, Washington, Baltimore, Philadelphia, North Carolina, the Outer Banks, for instance, Florida from about Fort Myers down, that all of that's going to get submerged as a result of sea rise. Because of my involvement with the MIT Secretary of Defense Discussion Group about the future, we were all concerned about overpopulation. Hmm. And if you remember back at that time, I mean, there were there was this famous debate between Paul Ehrlich and I've forgotten the other guy in which they bet that overpopulation and inadequacy of raw materials was going to cause a huge problem. And, and so I asked Remote Jury, well, I mean, is the world overpopulated? What's the status of population? And they said, well, that's not an issue. And I said, really? They said, yeah, yeah, it's not an issue. Actually, underpopulation in some areas is an issue. And of course, that's in the United States, a sperm count of men is uh, dropping significantly. Men are not as fertile as they used to be. Women are marrying later, having children later, having fewer children. Then, of course, the whole Chinese thing about they could only have one child. And now if you look at the projections on population, you find that overpopulation is no longer a big issue that people are talking about. But at the time, it was a huge issue. That was what all the futurists were predicting. Just to add to your point, a week ago was the first time in 60 years that China's population actually declined. Yes. In, in terms of Japan, as an example, last year they had fewer than 800,000 births. Yes. Their population is just under 125 million. By the end of this century, it's expected to be 53 million. So the follow-up question on this is, if we don't expect overpopulation, what about underpopulation and the effects of that, given the aging demographics around the world? Did you see a major issue with that or kind of did it well, correct uh, itself? Yes. The under, as I said, no one talks about overpopulation. So anyway, let me just continue. So from 1978 to 1991, I interviewed all these people all over the world. And then in 2018, I decided because so much of what they had said was correct. I mean, I could test that it was already correct. We weren't at 2050, obviously, but the trends that they were describing Plus, I publish a daily web publication, SchwartzReport.net, and I track trends, not from a non-local perception perspective, but just research. And and I'll put that those links in the description below. Well, in any case, yes, thank you. I had a sense of what the intellectual assessment of trends was, as well as this non-local perception. And I also had a question which nobody could answer at the time. And that is when someone does precognitively describe something, are they describing a fixed future or are they describing the highest probability at the time you're asking the question? Mm -hmm. And so I thought, well, I will go forward 10 more years to 2060 and I'll do the same thing, but for 2060, and then I'll be able to compare the 2050 data with the 2060 data. And maybe I can answer this question. Is it highest probability or is it a fixed future? And I'm doing that analysis right now. So I, I don't have a firm answer yet. But in any and case, how do, so I, and how do you assess that? How do you, is it based on hits? What's the methodology? Well, it would be based on are the people that are doing 2060 describing radically different things than the people in 2050, because it's close enough that in 10 years, 
I mean, if you go back to 2012, for instance, or 2013, the difference between 2013 and 2023, when we're doing this now, you would be able to measure how accurate that those predictions were and how much they differed. So I thought, well, I'll go forward 10 more years to 2060. And so in 2018, I began interviewing people to do 2060. And I had another question that had come out of the 2050 data. And that was, what is the difference between what people intellectually assess about the future and what they describe using non-local perception and also, when people think they're doing intellectual analysis, are they also doing intuitive analysis and don't recognize it? Mm -hmm. And so I started 2060, and I very deliberately did a thousand people, and I also did a thousand people who were asked not to do intuition or remote viewing or anything like that, but to do an intellectual assessment of the future, and I'm now comparing what they describe and what the people doing non-local perception describe. And I begin to suspect that people who think they're doing intellectual analysis are actually utilizing, although they don't recognize it, non-local perception. Mm -hmm. But I will know more about that when I continue with the data. I've got about 10,000 pages of data to analyze, so it's a pretty hefty job. But in any case, they described climate change, as I said, in detail, the 2060s describe it. I was also interested, because I could see even back in 78, because I had been in government and had had a lot of interaction with the Nixon administration and the Ford administrations, I could see what I came to call the Great Schism trend starting mm -hmm. between the blue states and the red states. And so I began asking questions about that. And the general take on it now that I see is I ask them, you know, does the United States still exist? And what they say consensually is the United States still exists, but real power has moved down to the states and groups of states. And in fact, if you look at what's going on in, in the United States today, you can see that that's happening. The red yeah. state, blue state difference is, is becoming quite extreme. I think there's also an element of the poor performance of centralized power, particularly in crises. The way that COVID was handled was not great. Well, that, that's all part of great schism trend the rising anti-intellectualism of the conservative movement. Also, a major issue with 78, even in 2018, I didn't really fully appreciate, is the weaponization of misinformation and the spread of weaponized misinformation through the Internet and social media. I mean, even in 2018, it wasn't what it is today. And today... As you know, I mean, the weaponization of misinformation is enormous. And, and AI's large, accelerate that trend, for sure. Yeah, there's AI's. a large percentage, about a third of the country, really lives in a false reality. And the other thing which I also didn't fully appreciate when I was originally asking the questions, and really I, I thought, gee, that can't possibly be right, but it turns out it is, is that we are going to become a racially a majority minority country that is no racial group will be the majority and there's about a third of american white people who simply can't tolerate that and that's the maggot world and they not only can't tolerate it but they are becoming increasingly violent about it so there's a huge struggle and that's what the remote viewers told me and i just I couldn't even figure it out. But 2060 people tell me that by 2060, race relations and gender equality are no longer the big issues that they are today. That people have mm. 
recognize that race is no longer such a definer and that women are uh, considered equal to men. Now, you can see currently with the, for instance, anti-abortion movement, which is really about subordinating women, that there's a huge issue going on now, but that it resolves by 2060. The other big thing that really stands out for me at this point in the analysis is that between 2040 and 2045, something happens in the United States and maybe around the world, but particularly in the United States, which creates a dramatic and existential change in the culture. And at first I thought it was a single thing. There's, you know, is something happening? Do aliens contact us? You know, whatever, something like that. Is there a meteorite that strikes it? No, I don't think that, that's not the issue. It, I, and I don't think it's a single issue. I think it, it's a variety of things. One is the end of the internal combustion engine. Mm -hmm. Huge deal. And we know now that countries in Europe and in certain states in the United States, California, for instance, they are committed to getting internal combustion powered vehicles off their roads by 2040, 2045. I think there is going to be other pandemics, and that's going to have a big effect. Climate change and the sea rise and rise in temperature is going to create existential crisis. When I ask people to describe the communities that they're in in the future, they talk about smaller communities and the architecture and the sort of the uh, aesthetics are much more like Scandinavian countries or Holland, much less air traffic. High-speed rail has become a much bigger deal. No internal combustion engines. Cars look very different. People don't travel as much. There is a lot of virtual reality travel. And you can see that happening. Yeah. A question on the transportation infrastructure. I think EVs consume a lot of electricity, but there's a supply demand imbalance right now in terms of not having enough power generation. What did you see as the solution to that? So as an example, if you see climate change, you're going to lose a lot of hydroelectric power, which is huge in the West. Solar and wind help, but they're good for peaking power. So they can only help up to about 25%. Nuclear power has the NIMBY issue, but it's the cleanest in terms of zero emissions. So how do they yeah, bridge it, the it's, gap? It, it's a disaster in terms of nuclear waste. And it's yes, a yes. huge, no story, huge right. problem. Uh, no. Well, several things are going on. And again, right now we are trying to create an electric charging, basically a gas station model. That is, you have right. charging stations. I don't think that's what's going to happen. I think what's going to happen is that they're going to build new highways which charge the vehicles that drive on them so that the charging station problems ceases to become an issue so that you don't have to make every road an electric charging road, but you make the highways and then that charges people's batteries. The big issue that to see is the lithium issue mm -hmm. because lithium is essential to all these batteries that they're making. But I believe there's going to be a new battery technology. And in fact, just this morning, in one of the research journals that I read, I read about 80 journals and media publications every day. I, I see already the beginning of new battery technologies, trying to develop new battery technologies. So I don't think the lithium battery is the future. People describe to me that nobody talks about batteries being a problem. They talk a lot about solar. Mm -hmm. They talk about tidal, that mm -hmm. is using the tides. Mm 
they talk about, yes, they're, relative to what you were saying, I think there's going to be three big migrations in the United States, huge migrations. I'm talking about millions of people away from the coast as a result of sea rise. We're going to see, for instance, in Florida, I think we're going to see a trillion dollar real estate collapse. It's going to have a huge effect on the economy because all these multi-million dollar coastal properties, you're not going to be able to get insurance. And in fact, I have written that the thing to look at and follow is what are the insurance companies doing? And what they're doing is they, they stop insuring areas which are at too high a risk. So then you have to decide, well, I'll just live here until it gets destroyed or I have enough money that I can rebuild it in any case or whatever. But massive migration away from the coast and river delta areas and all the sea rise areas out of the southwest. There are seven states that depend on the Colorado River, for instance. Mm -hmm. And the Colorado River's drying up, Lake Mead, Lake Powell are drying up. They're trying to use underground aquifers, but they're going to suck them dry. There's going to be massive change in agriculture. Areas which are the major agriculture areas in the United States now, it's not going to be possible. You can already see it happening in Central California, for instance, and along the farmlands dependent on the Colorado River. The Mississippi River is also so low that some boats can't navigate it. So away from the coast, that's one. Out of the southwest because of increased temperature, Phoenix, for instance, is projected to get a temperature of 114 degrees perhaps as much as 150 days a year. And I can tell you from my work in Egypt doing archaeological work that when it got to 114, the Bedouin, who were the diggers for the archaeologists, they just would put down their shovels or whatever they were working with and they'd go back in their tents. They just wouldn't do it. And I have been in areas where the temperature was 114 to 119 degrees. And I can tell you you just don't go outside because it's dangerous. So out of the southwest, because of lack of water and increased temperature, so you're going to see cities like uh, Phoenix, Tucson, Albuquerque, that are going to be radically realtered, Las mm -hmm. Vegas. And out of the central states, because of cataclysmic weather events, I was in Oklahoma speaking at a conference, and I was the, one of the, the keynote speaker, and they had a, a dinner party, f and they had a lot of public officials that came to this. And I was seated next to a man who was a county commissioner who, who didn't believe in climate change, by, by the way. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, what concerns you about the future? And he said, well, the thing we're really talking about is how many times do you rebuild a town? I said, what do you mean? And he said, we have towns that have been destroyed by tornadoes several times. And so the question is, how many times do you rebuild that town? And I said, you don't see that as part of climate change? <laughs> no. Anyway, so out of the central states, because of dramatic, catastrophic weather events, no overpopulation, people moving into smaller communities, most work seems to be done remotely, and you can again see that trend. I mean, in a number of American cities right now, office real estate is in crisis because mm -hmm. people are working from wherever and they're not coming into the office. And these office buildings, these huge skyscrapers, have rental problems. Very different kind of living situations. If you enjoyed this video, hit like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time.